Shalom, good morning. Oh, you speak Hebrew, that's good. It's good because we don't have to translate from Brooklyn to New Jersey. That would be difficult, my gosh. How many of you used to live in Brooklyn? Okay, I just want to see how many smart people we have here today. <laughs> well, that's great. So it was, it's wonderful to be here. It's, just, it's actually just good to be out of Brooklyn. And uh, so I'll take any invitation. Dave knows that. So, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm, it, it's an interesting uh, feeling being brought in for the plagues. You know, I, <laughs> it's kind of an odd utility fielder or pinch hitter. So, uh, but, but I happen to uh, uh, feel that probably plagues mean more to us these days. And, uh, and so, for me, you know, I mean, you just go to Passover, you fill up the glass of wine, you dip your pinky in, you put the drop on the table. You ever do this? Oh, it's fun. You should try it. Manischewitz, by the way. And you just put it in and you drop it on the plate, you shout the name of the plague, scare the children, and that's the end of it. But <clears throat> we have a little, little more to think about and uh, probably a little more sensitive uh, to plagues. So I get the 10th. And um, sort of the final plague. And this is the slaying of the firstborn. Very pleasant subject uh, for me. How many of you are firstborn males here? Just, okay, well, you would have been dead, just so you know. <laughs> so this, this sermon's for you. And so uh, Moses said in chapter 11, uh, verse 4, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who's behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be. And then uh, he goes on and says... Um, uh, we, we, we read the story, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Pharaoh was not cooperating. It was the 10th plague. And, you know, Moses never had a temper, right? You know, you say no. Good, I've got one for you this time, you know. And uh, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders, another one of the synonyms for plagues, may be multiplied in the land. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he didn't let the people of Israel go out of this land. So this last plague would be the final plague to sort of change the domestic policy uh, when it came to Hebrew slaves uh, for, for Pharaoh. And there's a, there's a lot to learn from this 10th plague. But one of the most important parts of the 10th plague is the central character of the 10th plague. And that central character actually becomes a very important part of the Bible story. And that's the Lamb and the Lamb of God. We sang about the Lamb of God. And so we're going to learn about the Lamb today. Is that okay? We're going to focus on the Lamb. We're not going to eat Lamb. No blood shed on the doors of the church. Although, that would be pretty graphic. Uh, I once had a, a pastor in, in Texas. I was going to go and present a Passover whole banquet uh, uh, with his church. And he said, we're working with the 4-H I said, well, that's, that's good. It's good to develop farmers, I guess, you know. I'm from New York and New Jersey. What do I know? You know? And he says, oh, yeah, no, we're going to raise a lamb. And then we're going to kill it before you come and we'll have a barbecue. So that sounds really interesting for a person from Brooklyn. We don't do that a lot. <laughs> I don't even know where I'd find one. And so uh, this is... Uh, going to be interesting for you, I hope, because the lamb is a central part of our faith. And uh, there's a lot to it. So in Exodus chapter 12, we're going to learn about uh, this lamb. And we're going to learn about the lamb as a prophecy. Have you ever thought about the lamb as a prophecy? So this morning, we're going to think of the lamb as a prophecy. Now, there are two major kinds of prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures. One is a literal prophecy. The literal prophecy is easy. 
It's a prediction in plain language of what is to come, and its fulfillment is usually pretty uh, evident. And so, uh, now, Christians have missed these prophecies over the years because sometimes there's a little bit of symbolism and, and so on, even with these prophecies, and uh, they can get pretty complicated. For example, many evangelicals thought Mussolini was the Antichrist. They were wrong. He may have been a, an Antichrist, but he was not the Antichrist. Then there's prophecy in type, and that's a picture. And the picture is sometimes couched in symbols, or maybe often couched in symbols, and it's really an Old Testament description or portrait, but it's kind of in charcoal or black and white. And then when it's fulfilled, sometimes in stages, it gets more and more color until it's in full color and full dimensional. And this is one of those prophecies. There are actually some stages to it. But we know that the Lamb of God is the fulfillment of the type in Exodus 12 because the New Testament says it is. <laughs> and one of the sure ways of knowing that you're right on a type is that the New Testament cell says, says it plainly that it was a type in one way or another. So I'm reading in, in John chapter 1, verse 29. And that's when, uh, can I use the word Yeshua sometimes? It just kind of pops out of my, it's Hebrew. I mean, I usually do speak English, but uh, sometimes when, it, you know, every Jewish person tends to float towards Hebrew when it comes to speaking about these things. And so uh, Yeshua means God is the Savior. Nice name, right? I think so. And so uh, John, uh, Jesus, or Yeshua's cousin, uh, introduces Jesus, Yeshua, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm reading in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he saw Yeshua coming to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, you and I have been reading this for years, and we kind of take it at face value, and we're not shocked or stunned by the statement. But think of yourself as a Jewish man or woman standing on the banks of the Jordan River. There's this kind of kooky prophet fellow who eats locusts and honey, which, by the way, are kosher, just so you know. Locust, if you want to try a locust, you'll be okay. And so, and dressed, you know, in an unusually un, you know, unfriendly uh, costume, uh, hanging out in the desert with Essenes or whoever he was hanging out with. And he says... Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away, away the sin of the world. It's not even Passover. And in walks this itinerant Galilean preacher whose day job was as a carpenter, and he just walks onto the scene. Nobody knows a whole lot about him, but that's quite an introduction. Uh, Bob could have done better with mine, you know, but... <laughs> Just saying right now, and good when he's not here. Okay, so this is Yeshua, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What in the world is he talking about? I mean, you realize that basically what John the baptizer is doing is taking the Exodus 12 lamb, wedding him to the Isaiah 53 lamb, and pointing out that Jesus is the fulfillment of this combined portrait. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It is, it, it is, it's, it's marvelous. But I'm telling you, those people had no clue. How would they know what he was talking about? But John was trying to explain why his cousin, this Galilean prophet, was coming to baptize him rather than the prophet, who was already well-known, baptizing the other guy. And so Jesus comes to be baptized uh, uh, by John, when indeed he should have been baptizing uh, uh, John. And so behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Now it's true in the rest of the New Testament. There's a lot about the Lamb of God, and... Uh, now, the writers of the New Testament were Jewish, so they probably celebrated Passover like me 
every year from uh, their birth forward. I don't think I've ever missed a Passover uh, since I was not even born yet. You know, nine months is a long time. Probably hit a Passover during that time. And so I don't think I've ever missed a Passover. And neither did probably any of the writers of the New Testament. They were all nice Jewish boys. You understand that. And so Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with, here it is, precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Messiah. Where did he get all that? <laughs> you know, Peter didn't have a heavenly download like Paul. So where did he get that? Well, he spent enough time, couple, three years with Jesus, plus the 40 days in the, in the post-resurrection vacation Bible school. <laughs> so Peter may have known a lot, but he was writing to a group of Jewish and Gentile believers, explaining to them and tying together these marvelous biblical truths. His lamb, he's, a, he's the lamb, he's unblemished, he's spotless, and his blood is precious, and he's the Messiah. You know, slow down a little bit when you look at these passages. That packs a lot into one little verse, doesn't it? Where does this come from? And then Rabbi Saul, all of you know Paul was a rabbi, correct? So God chose a rabbi to go reach the Gentiles. Doesn't make sense, but he did okay. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5, I love this, for Messiah, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. So he is the Messiah, he's the Passover, he's the sacrifice, his shed blood has impact on and on and on. So how did all of this come about? Well, Exodus 12. You have to understand Exodus 12. So we're going to take a look at Exodus 12 in a little bit of, of depth, and then we're going to go quickly over to the New Testament and see how Exodus 12, step by step, is fulfilled in the New Testament. Everybody with me? All right, typical Jewish stuff, you know. You know, Jew Jewish believers, uh, uh, people ask me, should I, sh should I share the gospel with my Jewish friend from the Old Testament? And I always say, yes, that will make them feel better. Uh, and when I found the New Testament in a phone booth in the middle of the Redwood Forest in Northern California, though I was born and raised in New York and lived my parents kidnapped me to Middlesex County from the end of my high school uh, career. But then I bolted and went out to San Francisco. But I was 17. I knew what I was doing. And, <laughs> and I had a thriving, thriving unregistered pharmacist business. <laughs> you were right. I was testing it to see. Dave said you would laugh at my jokes, and I was just making fun. And But I've given it up for, for a year now, so... So anyway, I read the New Testament, and I was struck by two, two different things. Number one, I was struck, struck by the fact that Jesus didn't celebrate Christmas or Easter. Have you ever noticed that? But actually, he celebrated Passover, tabernacles, uh, you name it. He was Jewish. I said, oh my word, I wasn't raised to think that Jesus was Jewish. Once I was, took my mom to a, a, sur, a messianic service, and after the service, we're driving back to, New, to Old Bridge, New Jersey, actually Freehold at the time. We're driving back, and I said, Ma, so pretty Jewish, huh? She says, oh, very Jewish, very Jewish, you know. I said, music was Jewish? She said, oh, yeah, my mother's a musician. She was in the minor key. It was great, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, so did you, did you, I mean, did you listen to the sermon? She says, you speak so wonderfully. You should have been a lawyer. And then... <laughs> She continues, and I said, so mom, you can see that you can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. No, you can't. <laughs> so what, what do you mean you can't? She said, look, were these people baptized? I said, well, they were immersed, just like, you know, religious Jews get immersed. You know that, right? 
some of you know that. They get immersed before weddings, in, in different times, sometimes before the Sabbath. I said, it's just, you know, typical Jewish baptism. She's, baptism. She says, no, it's not. I said, no, yeah, well, I guess you're right. She said, besides, Jesus converted and became a Catholic. <laughs> you notice, the Baptist didn't have a good witness to my mother, you know? <laughs> and so Jesus converted and became a Catholic, which means he was no longer Jewish. So when I came, when I was reading the New Testament, I had no clue that Jesus was Jewish. I thought the Apostle Paul was probably a priest. I mean, I, I had no idea who, the, who these people were. But the more I read, the more Jewish I discovered that it is. So all I can tell you is, I came to the Lord reading the New Testament when I discovered it was Jewish. <laughs> so yes, share the Hebrew scriptures with your Jewish friend, but don't stop. Keep going into the new. Just let them know that it was a, a, a Jewish book. Now, some people say there was one author in the New Testament who was not Jewish. Do you know who that was? Do you, have you heard the rumor? Okay, some people say Luke wasn't Jewish. I'm looking at, at Dave, you know, just to see. Okay. They, so some people say Luke wasn't Jewish. But what did he do for a living? You have to explain this in Indiana, but not in New Jersey. <laughs> so let's look at Exodus 12, and let's see what the Lamb does, what the Lamb is supposed to do, remembering that this is outlined in charcoal, and later on will become full color. So let's start. Um, that means... It's a new kind of gadget to change the slide. <laughs> so we're going to look at seven key elements. Keep them running. All right. So first, in verse 3, we are told to select the lamb on the 10th day of Nisan. Obviously not a car. <laughs> Nisan is the first of the Hebrew months. If you open up a traditional Jewish calendar, you will see that this is the first month. It falls out in March or April. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. It's 30 days, not, uh, I'm sorry, 360 days, not, three, not 365. And so it's a little complicated. Not all the, not all the dates fall out on the, on, at the right time. So, for example, uh, my grandmother, who died at 102, was born on the second day of Hanukkah. We celebrated a birthday on a different day every year. Depended on when the second day of Hanukkah fell out on our Gentile calendar. All right, so the 10th of Nisan. So the, the date of the, when we celebrate Passover changes on the regular Julian calendar, but it, it never changes on the Hebrew calendar. And so it's the 10th of Nisan. That's the date. Be there or be square. So on the 10th of Nisan, in this first primitive Passover, we, we select the lamb on the 10th day of the month. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, the month of Nisan, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now, secondly, it's not just the lamb. It's a perfect lamb. And so we read again in verse 5, the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. You see the New Testament writers were not making all this up. But they were getting it from Exodus 12 because they were Jewish, and they celebrated the Passover, and they knew the text. And so it had to be selected on the 10th, it had to be perfect, no blemish. What else? Third, the lamb was to be sacrificed on the 14th day of the month. Selected on the 10th, sacrificed on the 14th. Very particular. Now, I want to say something about the dating of the Hebrew calendar. So Chosen People Ministries, the ministry that I lead, um, which is now uh, uh, 227 years old. 
I'm sorry, 127 year old. And you thought we were old. 227, okay. Um, either way, I'm not the founder. <laughs> so you know. It was founded by a rabbi from Hungary, came to the Lower East Side of Manhattan, heard the gospel from a Polish Presbyterian missionary to the Jews who was preaching in Yiddish. Happens a lot, it does. And so he heard the gospel on, the low, on Rivington Street on the Lower East Side, accepted Jesus. He was probably 22, 23. Uh, and then eventually started Chosen People Ministries. Well, we've come a long way since then, but the rabbi did a pretty good job. We had a lot of great shoulders to stand on. And Chosen People has always had a nice blend of being Jewish and being a believer in Jesus. Some people ask me, now, are you a Jew or a Christian? You know the answer. Yes. <laughs> I love saying that. <laughs> and... So we weave it all together. In my heart, heart in my soul, it's all seamless. Uh, but we weave it all together, 100% for Jesus and 100% Jewish. For me, it's easy. And, but it's not so easy for some of our staff who are not Jewish. Although they do take advantage of our calendar because we give the Jewish holidays off and the Christian holidays <laughs> off. Some of you are already looking for a job. And the only other organization in New York that does that is the New York City school system. No. So anyway, so one of, one of our staff said, Mitch, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it's, 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 on a, it's on a Sunday. So do we get a compensatory day off? I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm trying to plan my week. I, I said, the Jewish holidays, are, they're established when God said, they, this is a calendar that came down from God, from Mount Sinai to Moses, to the Jewish people, same for centuries, millennia. I said, and you want to change it? <laughs> you can't change it. So no, there's no extra day off. <laughs> so it's the 14th of Nisan. Just remember that. That's the day. Fourth, according to the text, the blood was to be spread on the, uh, on the doorpost and lintel of the house. Verse 7. They had to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. So we're beginning to get a prophetic picture now. It's, it's rolling along. Number five. The blood would prevent the wrath of God from falling upon the Jewish people. Now, what did the Jewish people have to do with the plague? Well, some of the plagues leaked out and impacted the Jewish people, not just the Egyptians. It was kind of collateral damage. But in this, God was very specific because it's not exactly like, you know, frogs get in your soup. I mean, this is really, you're going to lose your firstborn male. So God tells them, again, uh, what to do. Reading in verse 13 of chapter 12. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Hence the name. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Then verse 22. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, put some of the blood on the top and on both of the sides of the house. Some people have seen the image of a crimson cross in those I want to tell you, unless that type is verified in the New Testament, you can't use it. But you can use it privately, okay? <laughs> Try not to teach it, though. Uh, but it does refer to the shed blood, of course. None of you shall go out of the door from your house until morning. That's a very important point, too. In other words, nothing will be able to protect you from the wrath of God to come. Even if the blood is on your doorpost, if you set foot outside, your firstborn males will be subject to the, to the plague. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he'll see the blood on the tops and the sides of the door and will pass over that doorway and will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Again, this is a very important uh, image uh, that's going to play out as the prophecy materializes and gets more colorful. Number six, 
The Jewish people were commanded to observe and memorialize this forever. In other words, the Passover was a sacrificial meal forever. I'm not going to tell you that the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be a Passover. I, I, I really don't know. I'm just hoping there's chopped liver. That's all. Some of you just got grossed out. Okay. Six. Sorry, number seven. And that is that the, it may be observed by the non-Jews, the stranger. There's a very important Hebrew word there. It's ger, G-E-R, ger, ger, ger. And that's a very important uh, concept in the Passover. Uh, and according to the text, um, I'm sorry, I combined, no, there's seven, that's good. Uh, let me read verse 43. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it. In verse 48, a foreigner residing among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised that he may take part like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat it. This also has tremendous prophetic implications, particularly for the church. So you ready to see the fulfillments now? We've got it, we've got it laid out, I hope. All right. So in order to understand this, we have to understand a little bit about the last week of the life of Jesus. And that means we need to have something of a chronology. The chronology of the last life of Jesus, which of course some of you have studied because I already know some of you go to BSF and community Bible study and you, and, and you come to church here. So I'm sure you've had some background on it. But let me just share a, a couple of points about the last week of Jesus' life in light of the Lamb. So if you look at the Gospel of John in chapter 12, uh, verse 1, John 12, verse 1. So I'm not putting everything on my PowerPoint because I want you to open your Bibles. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, I'm reading in the ESV, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So we can assume if you go backwards from the Passover, which was the 14th of Nisan, that this was the 8th of Nisan, which means that Jesus came to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus late on Thursday, and then, uh, uh, um, or in the, beginning of, uh, in the beginning of Friday, really, and came for dinner, essentially. So the dinner on the 8th of Nisan, maybe, maybe it was a Shabbat dinner. So we're not sure what time Jesus got there. Probably sometime on Friday, I'm converting Hebrew and English months all at the same time. So he probably got there sometime on Friday, and which would have been uh, the 8th of Nisan, the 8th of Nisan. And the importance of this uh, is that he had to get there before the Sabbath, because you can't travel on the Sabbath. So if the 8th of Nisan was Friday, he had to, he had to get there a little bit before the before the uh, beginning of the Sabbath, which technically would have still been, it's Friday for us, but it would have been the earlier uh, Hebrew, Hebrew uh, day, it would have been the 8th. And so he got there, and then he sat down on the uh, 8th of Nisan uh, with the folks that he loved so dearly, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and had a Sabbath meal. So the Sabbath meal happened on Friday night, which would have been the 8th, evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the first day. And so he had the meal. Not, there's a lot that happened in the Gospel of John, and, uh, and you can read it. Uh, he was anointed with, he was anointed with, pre, uh, with burial oils which in itself was a prophecy that, um, that happened. 
On the ninth, not much happened because it was five days before the Passover, the ninth of Nisan. It would have been the Sabbath, and not much happened. Then we come to the tenth. So the tenth of Nisan would have been Saturday night through the Sunday. You kind of with me? So Saturday night through the Sunday would have been the tenth of Nisan. So what happens on the tenth of Nisan? The lamb is selected. And then for four days, the lamb is tested to make sure that the lamb is without blemish, healthy, and perfect. And then on the 14th of Nisan, the lamb is slain. And so there are four days between the selection of the lamb and the slaying of the lamb. During that time period, Yeshua presented himself as perfect and sinless, totally obedient to the law, so that he could die for our sins. Friends, he couldn't die for our sins if he was a sinner. He couldn't die for our sins if he was flawed. And so it's really important that the predicted Lamb of God was to be unblemished and that Jesus demonstrated that he was morally and spiritually unblemished. Then on Nisan the 14th, uh, the Thursday of the Passion Week, the whole process of the crucifixion uh, began. Probably on Thursday night, uh, they celebrated the Passover. Would, it, would have been the beginning of the 14th of Nisan. The lamb would have been slain, however, in the temple, which was the custom. The lamb for the nation would be slain on Friday. Now, when did Jesus go to the cross? On Friday. Why did he go to the cross on Friday? Number one, because he was born to die, and he knew it. Number two, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was born to die for the sins of the world. This was predicted in detail in Isaiah chapter 53, which is part of the color that colors in the black and white. Like a lamb, he was led to his slaughter. But he also died on Passover because the lamb, the Exodus 12 lamb, was to die on the 14th of Nisan. He fulfilled that type as a prophecy by dying on Passover. Amen. He was selected on the 10th. He was flawless and demonstrated it. He died as the perfect lamb who dies for our sins on the 14th at Nisan at about 3 p.m. That's about the time the major Passover lamb was sacrificed in the temple. I always like uh, going to Israel and visiting the garden tomb. Uh, anybody been to Israel? Okay, some of you are hoping for the second coming, getting a free ticket, right? <laughs> the brunches may not be as good, though. Just, just warning you. So one of the loveliest places to visit in Israel is the garden tomb. And the garden tomb is usually run by, it, it's, it's spectacular, it's just so peaceful and beautiful, and, it's, and it's every, all the little tours are run by retired British pastors and thoroughly evangelical. And it's just, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's near the, the central bus station in the middle of a busy Jerusalem. And, you know, you go into the garden tomb and it's just... I don't know, the Spirit of God is there in such a powerful way. And then you go into that little cave where um, Jesus may well have been buried, and, and there's a, a slab there uh, that a lot of the Russian Orthodox come and weep and weep and weep and, and, and clean it with their tears virtually. And uh, I love going in there, especially when it's quiet and just meditating for a moment because I want to experience the fact that he's not there. <laughs> now, is the garden tomb actually the tomb where Jesus was laid? There are differing views. But like all spots in Israel, I always say the same thing. If it's not it, it's a lot like it. <laughs> but from a certain part in the garden tomb, you can look 
right at the Temple Mount. So if Jesus was being crucified nearby, on a hill, he was, it, was, it was in the mountain range, same mountain range where Isaac was almost sacrificed. Jesus could have been looking directly at the lamb being sacrificed on the Temple Mount in the temple. Almost at the same time. You see, he's the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. Further, when a man or a woman, a boy or girl, Jew or Gentile, by faith takes the blood of the Messiah and smears it on the doorposts of their own hearts, then the wrath of God passes over us and we pass from death into life. Passover is a continual observance for all those who are either Jewish or who have been grafted in to the rich root of the olive tree, who are part of that group of strangers that have had their hearts circumcised and now identify with Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. If you're one of those people, then whenever the custom is of this church, though I believe it's probably monthly, whatever the custom is, you celebrate the fulfillment of, the Lord, of, of Passover every Lord's Supper. Because in Luke 22, we understand that Jesus broke the bread, drank the wine, and said, this is the new covenant. Technically, really, like all covenants that are lasting, Sealed by blood. The blood of the perfect Lamb of God. I remember my first Passover as a believer. It was awesome. I didn't know any of this. <laughs> but discovered it as we were doing it. <laughs> I was only a few months a believer. And then I re remember my first Passover coming back from California as a repentant hippie, <laughs> telling, <laughs> telling my parents what had happened to me, which they were not thrilled about. I became a member of a really good conservative Baptist church in Sarah, called Sarah Wood's Bible Church now in New Jersey. And I began having a Bible study in my parents' living room and we started having like 40, 50 people. My mother said, I said you could study the Bible. I didn't think there'd be this many people. And about 50% of them were Jewish. Then when the synagogue that they were attached to began giving, sending, having phone calls with my mother, I moved into the Bible college dorms. <laughs> but the whole Bible study was picked up by Sarah Witz and brought over to the church. That's how I became a conservative Baptist. They bailed me out. <laughs> but I was so excited about the Lord, what he had done in my life. And I went to my first Passover as a believer. Probably I was a believer six, seven months. And my uh, um, uh, second Passover, sorry. And my mother gave me strict instructions if you tell your grandparents, I'll break your fingers, you know. So that was, I got that, understood that, you know. And so, she really was very sweet, though. And she was just a little touchy on this one. My parents were ultra-Orthodox Jewish people. And so, I remember when we got to the point in the, in the, in the Passover where my grandfather raised the shank bone of the lamb and told the story of the tenth plague. And all I wanted to do was jump up and say, probably in front of 30 not yet believing Jewish relatives, and just yell, Grandpa, Grandpa, it's Jesus. <laughs> Can't you see it? It's Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I knew that verse. But I didn't do it. 
because my mother threatened me. <laughs> but I, I was trying to be a repentant, disobedient child. <laughs> Eventually, my grandparents found out what I believed. And actually, toughest thing I've ever experienced as a believer, they actually never talked to me again. That's the hardest thing I've ever experienced as a believer. But listen, he's worth it all, isn't he? He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. More importantly, listen, he takes away your sin and he takes away my sin. It's because of his perfect sacrifice and his powerful resurrection from the dead that we can have this relationship that lasts forever with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And friends, this morning, whether you're here or you're watching on some kind of computer device, I want to tell you, he is worth everything. And if you've never put your trust in Jesus as Messiah, as the Lamb of God who's taken away your sin, you should do it. You know, I've never heard anybody say, gee, that was a bad decision. It will change your eternity, and you will know what it's like to be forgiven of your sin. Just one more verse from John, and I'll close. This is, a, if, if, if the journey begins in Exodus 12, it's filled in with Isaiah 53. It's further filled in in the Gospels. It's really, really brought home and capped in the book of Revelation, whereby that same John says this. I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them were myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. We sang it to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. I think, Paul, I think John just ran out of words. Yeshua, Jesus, is the eternal Lamb of God. And we will have the joy of being with him forever because he laid his life down for us. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, I, I, I'm speechless, Lord, when I think about how your plan was so carefully laid out and how beautifully your son, Yeshua, fulfilled that plan. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to the word where that plan was revealed and that in this season of plagues that we might bring healing and help and joy and blessing because we know the one who one day will wipe all the tears from our eyes. And we thank you for Yeshua, your son. And it's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen.